you know, we'll start seeing strawberries at the farmer's markets. We'll start seeing them on sale just because of the way, you know, this is the season, it's coming. Um, you can actually wash them and you never want to wash your berries until you're going to eat them because uh, otherwise they'll start breaking down on you. But for this case where you're going to freeze them, you can wash them out, put them on a baking tray or cookie sheet or whatever you have that's lined with parchment paper or um, some nonstick, if you want aluminum, whatever. You want to just be able to put them all down in that parchment, uh, on that uh, baking sheet and freeze the tray. Or if you have only a plate and you don't have room in your freezer for something as wide of a cookie sheet, that's okay, take a plate, do the same thing. Just, but the idea is to freeze them separately so that at the end, once they're frozen solid, you can put them in a Ziploc bag and they won't freeze as a, as a whole clump. So if you ever got for your smoothies, like frozen strawberries, sometimes they all clump together and it's because of that. They weren't frozen individually or they thawed and then they were refrozen. So that thawing process caused them to kind of bring, become a family again, and then they froze solid. And that's annoying, because especially if you just want to utilize one or two berries or a couple, you know? So, but yeah, thinking about, you know, can I freeze something myself? You can do that with peas. You can do that with a lot of your know, blueberries. There's so many things that we can freeze and think about that as a way of preserving them. Um, another person asks, uh, um, can you give me some ideas of how to use food scraps? Uh, potato peels, uh, broccoli stalks, that type of thing. I think soup automatically, unfortunately, is not necessarily soup weather <laughs> when we start thinking about it getting too warm. But sometimes it's soup, you know, they say if you drink hot food or drink hot drinks when it's, um, when it's really warm out, it actually helps cool you down some way. Um, but at the very least, you can make a, a soup out of it. If I, if think about roasting them, you know, and just doing like a chip version, you know, like it might, it might be thinner. Uh, sometimes those little, um, you know, like happy hour times have potato skins, right? And you can just toast your potato skins, roast them off, maybe add a little, you know, fun stuff on top if you like, or some serve it with some sour cream or whatever makes you happy. But the idea then, that's a nice way of roasting them. Asparagus tips, for instance, you know, the proper way, like when you take, when you buy a bundle of asparagus, if they're rubber band, um, you snap one and then you know where the rest of them should pretty, pretty much snap off. Um, so you're not just kind of utilizing just the top portion of the asparagus and letting the whole bottom go to waste. Um, but what we find with asparagus, the bottom can be very woody, right? It gets very thick. If you take a potato peeler, a vegetable peeler, and actually peel away at the bottoms, you start opening up somewhere it might be possibly tender. So you're not wasting as much. Right, so you're getting now a little bit more usage and not just utilizing that first half, but really getting down a little bit more. So you will waste, but it's not about saying, I mean, we want to get as close to no waste as possible, but even if you waste that much less, you know, it all adds up, right? And we don't, you know, so yeah, so peeling, that works. Uh, what was another vegetable that she named? Or the person named, I'm sorry? Uh, Wilted lettuce, you talked a little bit yep. about apples, broccoli stalks. Bro uh, apples, we've seen the bags where they dehydrate them and they basically roast apples. Um, so that's a nice way of doing them if you like apple chips or something like that. Uh, or applesauce, like I do, uh, you know, I've done cooking classes with kids where, you know, everyone throws in a variety of apple skins on and everything, a little bit of cinnamon, no sugar, and you just cook it down. Right, and that's really great if you want to add it to baked goods. If people, you know, substitute, you know, some ingredients, swap out. You can swap out some ingredients for applesauce in your ingredients. You can add it to your just eat applesauce. Period. You know, for a snack. But it's a nice way again utilizing apples. Um, um, somebody asks, what kind of salt is best in cooking, or do you use table salt? I love this question because <laughs> I, I have my own. Um, you can't name it a pinch of salt and not have a preference. But the thing, is, most importantly, okay, so table salt has iodine. And what that does is it creates a, a metallic flavor. Like it's funny because like when you grow up, if you grew up on like Red Cross or Morton, you grew up with it. So it's very, your, your palate is, you know, can just accept it the way it is. But once you try other salts and you try to go back to it, you start realizing, wait a minute, there's a difference. So sea salt, obviously, going, is going to be the most saltiest. Okay, and then and salt is so it has a great way. I love kosher salt, is my thing. 
Um, the reason why is I like the fact that if I'm salting something and I get distracted, it doesn't seep into the food so quickly that you don't even know if you salt it. And me, I'm a mother of two kids that, I, you know, one quick turnaround, then it's like, you know, what did I salt? Did I not salt? Did I salt how much? You can actually still see it. Also, because of the, the texture, it's pretty even. So when it does seep into the food, it has a more even coating than something rocky, um, you know, like a sea salt that's really coarse, okay? Um, there is fine sea salt, but again, being that that's the saltiest of the salts, I prefer that kosher salt kind of has that nice little in-between balance. Um, and just keep in mind that no matter what your preference is, two things. One, we know like there's Himalayan salts, there's gray salts, there's a lot of health properties to a lot of different salts, but not all salts are cooking salts. Some are just for finishing, okay? And so for instance, Malden makes a very flaky, it's a French type of salt. It's very flaky. If you ever had truffles, like chocolate truffles, they flake them on top. Those are finishing salts. So over a good steak, for instance, you might want to add a little bit of flaky salt because it, what it does is it adds a nice texture in the mouth, right? A nice mouth feel and kind of rounds out the meal from the fattiness of the meat or on asparagus where you really want to make it pop. So flaky salt and stuff like that is a great finishing salt. When you're thinking about everyday salt, you want something that's inexpensive so you can actually maintain it, right? Um, kosher salt is like $3 for a big box, you know? And just know that the, the each salt in a recipe, if it stays a tablespoon, it's not interchangeable because each one weighs differently. So a tablespoon of kosher is not the same as a tablespoon of sea salt. So you wanna be mindful of that because then you say, oh my God, I've made this dish and it's too salty. Um, you, wanna, you wanna know that it's not, and plus if sea salt is the saltiest of the salts, it's obviously not going to need as much as you would have kosher salt, right? So you wanna know your salt, really work with it. And the last piece of advice I'll say about salt is never sprinkle it from the actual container. And the problem is, is if you do, you'll, ne you'll never understand how to work with salt properly, okay? So, you know, when you're, you're thinking about salting food is one of the biggest and most important things in terms of technique, right? Because you make something one way and spot on and the next day it's like, ah, oh, I needed more salt. And you try to sprinkle on the top of it and it'll never get there. You want to be able to put it in, you know, a mason jar, a salt pig, something that you can actually feel the salt. Because at the end of the day, if you salt, let's say I'm making roasted chicken and I salt how much I think looks right. If I eat that chicken and I say, man, next time I have to add more salt, because I felt it, I was able to tell myself next time I need to add more because I can feel what that looks like. When you sprinkle, how am I supposed to know how much more sprinkling I do the next time? So really get adjusted to your salt. Oh, excellent. Um, someone asks, we're, we're actually going to talk a little bit about this in a minute. Um, we're starting a uh, Grow a Row campaign where people will uh, grow food for food um, centers. And uh, the question is what vegetable, what vegetables are most wanted in food centers? What are the best ones to donate? Um, that's a great, that's a fabulous question. Uh, onions, a lot of the aromatics, are, you know, when we think about seasoning that is cultural, like it goes throughout a lot of cultures. Peppers are great vegetables. Um, funny enough, eggplant, is not one that's so popular, I've learned, in food pantry work, uh, which is so funny. Um, it, it's not. Uh, uh, Kalaloo, uh, a lot of the leafy greens, whether it's spinach, whichever way it comes, um, Swiss chard, um, those are really fantastic. And they go very quickly in, you know, um, when I've seen them in food pantries, people are really excited. And beets, beets are very popular. Um, so that's a couple. I'm assuming that if they are past their prime, uh, as long as they're not actually, uh, you know, in damaged condition, you'd be willing to take them? Yep. Yep. Most definitely so. Most Good. definitely so. So I think at this point, we might, I might ask you to talk a little bit about your experience in, um, in what you do in the food shelters and perhaps a little bit about your experience in New York City and what you're doing now in Bridgeport? Okay, so it started from something, you know, I, in, in New York I worked, I volunteered for a similar program where we did food rescue um, and I did that for about five years and through that became this cooking education for people, like what do we do with what we have? Um, with, you know, keeping costs down, being resourceful and flexible, right, because you, you, you never know what you're going to get. And at that food pantry that I worked for, it was really cool to be able 
to work one-on-one. -on -one. So we did a, we had a um, cooking class within that food pantry. And so what it allowed was as people were waiting for their name to be called to see a social worker or waiting for the food pantry, they can actually participate in a cooking class. This way they got to utilize things that were, they were actually getting from the food pantry that day um, and see a quick cooking demo and take a sample. And so that grew into kind of saying, okay, how do we actually make, get employment for this, right? How do we make jobs and actually train people? And so that culinary training went in that sense of like saying, what are some of the basics that we can give people where they can walk away with some knowledge for their families and for themselves, but possibly get a job. And so when I moved to Bridgeport here about eight years ago, I wanted to bring some of that background here because I thought it was just so exciting um, and, and just so fab. It's just fabulous. Uh, so I paired with um, uh, the Council of Churches of Greater Bridgeport then um, and created the Create Culinary Training Program, which I basically went back to my uh, culinary books and I actually looked at lessons that I thought were really important, you know, how to make a stock, how to go to knife skills, how, really the foundation of cooking, you know, um, and created Create. Um, you know, since that program is still continuing to run separately, but I've taken on some students from that program who've continued to be mentored by me and added on, you know, to say like, well, how do we now create a business out of this? Now you've gotten these skills. And so a lot of my students, thank fortunately, are now, you know, selling empanadas. Um, they, are, they are making their own hot sauce, like Dave's Angry Hot Sauce. They are doing some, you know, one has opened up a breakfast style uh, farmer's market vendor uh, table where he's doing things to order. Um, so it's really been exciting to see them grow in this way. And the farmer's markets have been such a great vehicle for that it just providing that space where they can sell their products, um, gain some more experience. And so when you say I, I cater, so when I cater, which is pretty cool, so when I get to cater events, um, I hire my students to work alongside me. So it builds their skill level and it also kind of reinforces what they've learned versus what is actually happening out there in the world. So I do a little bit of everything, but I really think it's important when you're thinking about you know, community driven and you're really thinking about seeing how do we get everyone together for that cause, right? And so it works on all ways. We're learning about keeping waste down. We're learning about how to actually work together as a team, how to incorporate the farmer's markets in it, neighborhood, nonprofits, right? All of us benefiting one way or another and it, for a bigger picture, which is pretty fantastic. That's great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Um, at this stage, I'm going to um, actually thank you, Sh Sh Chef Raquel. I'm going to give the screen over to um, uh, Danielle Blaine, who's from Food Rescue US. Uh, just have to bear with me. Okay. You may just, sorry. <laughs> And here we go. There we go, Danielle. Can you okay. introduce yourself? Thank you. I wanted to thank Chef Raquel too. I now know I've been using the Himalayan salts and cooking with them instead of just putting them on top of the meat. So lots of good tips. And I love what you're doing with Bridgeport with the community there. Uh, Food Rescue US works with a lot of the Council of Churches and a lot of the community kitchens and getting meals out to uh, all the members out there. So I hope we can maybe do something with you in the in the future. Um, Food Rescue US, um, right now we know that probably a lot of Westport has, has heard of it. We rescue food from grocery stores. Um, it's the food that is perfectly fresh that ends up in the dumpster. And we know up to 40% of food can be thrown away from both farms and at the grocery store level, which is just heartbreaking when you know how many people are out there who need the food. Um, we work on a volunteer basis. We have 226 volunteers right now in Westport. And uh, in Westport, they'll help us pick up the food at a Trader Joe's or um, it could be any type of restaurants um, right now. Um, even right now we're delivering meals and they help bring it to the food pantries, sometimes local, sometimes to Bridgeport. Overall in Fairfield County, we now have about 1,196 volunteers, especially during this time. 
a lot of people are out of work and they've stepped up to try to help the community in need um, by getting out to places maybe they haven't been before to try to help. We have a lot of people going to Danbury and to Bridgeport where there are huge numbers of people showing up at the agencies. Right now they're seeing um, probably 80 to 100% increase in members who are going there. Um, so it's a great time to help. Our company was started in 2011 as Community Plates, if anyone had heard of us then. And then in 2017, um, Kevin Mullins and Jeff Shacker both created our app, which brought together the food donors, the receiving agencies, the volunteers, um, so we all could communicate with each other and work out a system where we can see on the app, if there's something to pick up at a grocery store, you just claim it on the app. Um, and then on your regular grocery shopping, you can come pick it up and just bring it. It usually only takes about 30 minutes and you can drop it off at one of your local receiving agencies. Right now we have about 30 sites in the United States. Um, we've kind of changed just from rescuing from grocery stores to also rescuing from restaurants, schools, hospitals, um, corporate cafes, and now we also rescue from farms. So we are hoping to be um, a great part of the partnership. 40% um, of food at farms also get thrown away. We've been picking up excess milk that was, you probably heard in the papers, was being dumped down the drain. We went out to Danbury, uh, UConn got in touch with us through their agricultural department and we picked up carloads of milk before it expired and brought it to our agencies, which was just wonderful. We've done the same with yogurts. Um, restaurants have called us to come pick up their food and take it to the um, agencies. So people have really been reaching out during this time. Um, if anyone's interested in doing a rescue, it only takes about 30 minutes of your time. Um, we are not only feeding the agencies, but we're also keeping food out of landfills, which is um, one of the great second parts of, of what we do. Um, it's cutting down um, the methane gases, saving the environment. Um, last year, uh, in just Fairfield County alone, we saved 2.5 million pounds of food from landfill. And that equates to 2 million meals that went out to people who are hungry. Um, it's just such a, an easy answer to a problem I didn't even realize really existed till I did my first uh, Trader Joe's and grocery store rescues. And you just think to yourself, that would have wound up in the garbage and there are people who are hungry, my neighbors right around the corner. So it's a wonderful, easy thing to do with your family if you're retired. Um, right now we're gonna start working with farms, with the Westport Farms, we're working with Ambler Farms, Fairgate Farms, um, Grace Farms. So if anyone is interested in helping us rescue food from your local farms or from any of our local donors, all you really need to do is download the Food Rescue US app or you can email me at danielle at foodrescue.us to get some more information about how you can help. Great. Will you be doing any gleaning? Um, and maybe Chef Raquel can explain what that is better than I can. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you have to take your speaker off. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Gleaning, I, I think she would probably rescue, uh, do this better than me. Um, yes, she would probably explain it better than I. <laughs> Daniel, yes? We, we pick up all kinds of food, so anywhere we can help. And actually, too, we'll probably be asking our volunteers, who are our volunteers, also help out more with agencies. They help out on the farms. So I, I, I'm quite sure our volunteers can help out with that as well. Great. All right. Um, the next slide. So um, the other thing that we're doing in Westport is uh, for the first time this year, we're introducing a Grow a Row program. Uh, I was uh, approached by members of the Westport Community Garden and the Christ and Holy Trinity Church and they both uh, s said that there are people who would like to be giving food to food centers and how could we do this so uh, between the three of us uh, the three organizations we came up with a plan to encourage uh, Westporters if they're growing their own vegetables or, or fruit uh, and they have extra to give it uh, or even to actually plant a row for um, growing to then give to donation um, centers. So the plan is to um, uh, encourage people to make donations and you can actually bring donations to Christ and Holy Trinity Church uh, near Branson Hall. There's a sign on one of the doors 
between the hours of 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., I think every day of the week, um, and just drop food off in the cooler. Um, and that food will then be brought by volunteers to um, Bridgeport food centers. Um, and the same program uh, is going to be done at the Westport Community Gardens, and I believe there'll be a container outside of the um, entrance to the gardens. Um, I understand that uh, one of Chef Raquel's students is going to be helping with um, making meals for Food Insecure. Um, and uh, Raquel, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so every, I think it's every Wednesday, they do uh, feel the warm over at the United Congregational Church. And so Chef Vito um, prepares meals for up to 300 people. And they're coming from, you know, the community right now with COVID, they have, um, they're, they're, ha they're asking people who do have um, abilities to drive, you know, so they're doing it as a prepared in a, you know, in a commercial kitchen safely, obviously, and then packaging them already um, so that every person, you know, who comes in need, and there's no requirement. So it can be, you know, a family, just someone looking for some meals. There's nothing. You can just basically come to get a meal, which is fantastic. And yes, relies greatly on the donations, like what you're uh, describing in terms of, you know, giving some vegetables, because no matter how little the quantity it makes so such a difference. And the funny thing is, is that sometimes there's those rare ingredients that can just be like a gar fresh garlic, which seems, you know, simple enough and you don't even think about it. That makes all the difference in a dish, you know, and really makes that us chefs happy. So by all means, yeah, it'd be really fantastic to continue to work with uh, Vito at some point to um, pump up some of these meals based on these donations. And uh, I did get a question that someone asked me, um, do you think they'll accept herbs? And I'm like, yeah, I think well, so. We never get herbs. <laughs> that would be so cool. <laughs> it would be awesome to get herbs. Yes. Um, so I think between Food Rescue US and the Grow a Row um, that uh, Westport can help contribute towards um, the food uh, necessity in, in other communities and in our community. Um, so just to end uh, this, uh, we always try to end on a positive note on what you can do. And I, I hope we've given you enough um, ideas of how you can um, uh, reduce your food waste and, and help others. Um, just for your information, all of this will be, is being recorded and will be available um, on the sustainablewestport.org website. So if for some reason you were not able to watch it all or you know someone who might be interested in watching it, you can refer people to that um, website. Um, and we will be offering other uh, talks to do uh, with the Zero Food Waste Challenge. The next one is Composting Basics with Alice Ely. And she is a um, master composter in town. She, um, and I have heard her speak before and she gives a dynamic um, and fast paced but very comprehensive discussion on home composting. Uh, and then the next one will be the following, will be next Wednesday about um, the new food scraps recycling program that will be opening up at the transfer station on July 6th. So if you're interested in um, registering for either of those, you go to sustainablewestboard.org and look at the events. Um, tab and you can sign up there. Uh, so I think at this stage, um, although I am, uh, yeah, I just want to take the last minute or two to say we could talk forever. Um, there are still questions coming in. I will take a look at them um, and we'll make sure that those questions uh, are answered uh, to the best of our ability. Um, but I think um, we should probably uh, say that uh, this has been an excellent uh, introduction to how we can plan, prepare, and preserve food uh, to waste less. And I can't thank you enough, Chef Raquel, um, for, for doing this. You're a dynamic speaker, and I always enjoy listening to you. Um, and I thank Food Rescue US for joining us. And um, as always, uh, we love having the sponsorship of Earth Place and the Westport Library. Um, and last but not least, I'd like to thank uh, the Zero Food Waste Challenge team for um, helping get this show on the road. <laughs> really appreciate it. So thank you, everyone. Really appreciate it. Bye. Yeah.